before I preach this morning, we've been sharing over the last few weeks in and around the table of the Lord. How many of you have uh, been here while we shared around sitting at the table of the Lord and God setting a table for you in the presence of your enemies? One of the biggest mistakes Christians can make is to think that being a happy, prosperous, uh, successful Christian means that you'll never have any enemies around. Jesus says, I'll set a table for you in the presence of your enemies so that you can demonstrate who your God is and deal with them when they try to come closer. If you haven't been here, I'll encourage you to get that sermon and listen to it. And then secondly, we started sharing in and around the, the meaning uh, of restoration. God wants to restore things in our lives. And so before I'm going to share this morning, uh, we've got a fine young lady here with us. Where are you, Michelle? Stand up. Here you are. Come up so long. Uh, Michelle is, uh, is with us. She's an intern pastor with us at the moment. She went and studied theology and finished a degree. And after she finished a theology degree, she decided to come to our gap year and spend a year here. And this year, she's on our staff as an intern and walking her career path out with her. But she, Michelle has got an amazing testimony. And last week when we shared in and around the table of the Lord, she came to me and said to me, let me tell you something about what God has done for me in this last week. She was on holiday. While I was on holiday, what God has done for me to finish up some of the things that has happened to me in my life. So I've asked her to come stand a bit closer, Michelle, and uh, to share just in and around that with us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Louis, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. So my story um, of restoration, um, six years ago, um, I was jogging on our farm, and then all of a sudden the enemy tried to steal so much from me, and I was attacked by a guy and then also raped. And um, it would have been so easy for me just to allow the enemy to come and sit at my table and for fear to come and sit at my table. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Louis. <laughs> so it would have been so easy to allow the enemy to come and sit at my table. And I could have so easily say, you know what, I'm just going to give up now. I'm going to let, let the enemy come and just ruin my life and let fear take over and never run again or um, you know, just be shattered. But there's a scripture in Romans 8 verse 28 that says, um, but if we allow God, then he can make anything work for the good of you know, the Afrikaans. Say, God can all things good for work for what he loves. He can make everything work for the better for those who love him. But it was still a decision that I had to make. I had to make that decision that I'm going to allow the Lord to make to change this thing into something good. And then the Lord started with the restoration um, process in my life. And um, two weeks ago when I was on holiday, um, the Lord completed my process of restoration completely. And I finished a 21-kilometer half marathon run at the Naisna, um Forest Run at the Oyster Festival. And it was such a privilege because as I was running this, I really felt how God has been speaking to me and um, how he just restored the whole process and not even just bring restoration, but for the better. And I'm better off than what I was before. And I think this sometimes sounds crazy, but if I have the decision or I have to say, should this happen to me again, then I would say, you know what? I would choose that this whole thing would happen to me again because where I am today, the way God restored me, I'm completely better than where I was before the whole thing happened. <laughs> and even just something like a, a physical thing, maybe it was just a physical where I could maybe run a six before. Now I actually finished a 21. How God just said, hey, you can even do better now. And as I was running and getting tired, obviously, I could just feel how Father God was encouraging me and telling me, hey, my girl, you can do this. Just keep on going. And as I finished at the, at the finish line of completing the 21, all the people were standing there cheering. And it literally felt like it was God and his angels cheering me on and say, you've completed this. You've conquered this. You are running now in victory. And you have complete... You have complete victory now over what the enemy tried to stole from you. And that is what can happen when we allow Father God to come and restore us and not allow the enemy and fear to sit at our table, but say, you know what, God, I'm handing this completely over to you so that you can bring restoration in my life. So, 
So I just want to encourage you to listen to what Pastor Louis is saying. Because as he was preaching last week about restoration, I could just say, Amen, Amen, Amen to everything. Because not only I'm agreeing and I'm contending for that, but I've experienced it in my life. That when we allow God to restore us, we're better off than what we was before. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Can you do that? Give him a shout. Thanks, Michelle. Beautiful. Say restore. One more time, restore. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that you are a restorer of all things. Thank you that you can change things around for whatever the enemy intended for destruction, for your glory, for our good, and for the salvation of a nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready this morning? I want to talk to you. I want, to, want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 5. I'm going to speak on restoration again today. Restoration. I want to speak from Mark chapter 5, and I want to mention three things out of it. There's a lot of stuff that we're going to share in and around uh, Mark chapter 5, but there are three things I want to highlight out of this chapter. Number one, I want to revisit what it means, what restoration means. Say restoration, please. What restoration means. Number two, we want to speak about the effects of restoration, and then we want to talk a little bit about the result of restoration, the results of restoration. Amen? Now, just to define restoration again, it is important that we understand that restoration is not God fixing a few things up. I said it last Sunday, I want to say it again. Restoration is not a fix-up job. I'm not a fixer-upper. You know, you know what a fixer-upper is? A fixer-upper is when you buy something that is not in a good condition at all, but has got potential that if you quickly, you know, paint it, like it said last Sunday, a bit plak spoog and ferf. You know, if you just stick on a few things and patch a few things and quickly paint it, you can sell it quickly for a few bucks more and make a few rand on it. And people see the potential in it. They know that there is something's not right and they kind of choose almost to ignore it. You know that if you touch it, then more than just the polyfiller comes off. Now I want you to know here this morning that you are not a fixer-upper. And sometimes we're in such a desperate place of pain and hurt and all the things that happen to us, that all we want is a fixer-upper. We want to feel better. Uh, and we want things, just our circumstance to change a little bit. And God says, I'm a God of restoration. And restoration means that the person or the product is returned to its original owner, state, and condition. Restoration means that the product or the person is returned to its original owner, state, and condition according to it, the designer and the creator's intent and blueprint. In other words, when you restore something, really according to the way that you should restore it. You can't just go and buy something, especially if it's got historical value and, and, um, and history to it. And people say, you can't just do what you want to. You have to go and find the original blueprint, the original intent of that place, and then restore it according to that. Come on now. The amazing thing about restoration, whenever you really restore something properly, it is always in a much better condition than what it was before. Because they'll take out the rusted pipes or the twin by, uh, two by fours or whatever and put the, the rotten ones, replace them with better ones, better quality ones, better quality material, better quality stuff that is now available. Though they return it to its original state and condition, as the designer and the architect or the, the, the creator has intended. So I want you to know this morning, listen carefully, it doesn't matter what it is that you're going through, it doesn't matter what has happened to you, God can restore you. If you would allow Him to. If you would allow, God, God would restore you if you would allow Him to. Sometimes the fear, the pain, the rejection... The uncertainty, the loss has been so massive that what we want is we just want a fixer-upper. 
Say to the person next to you, I'm not a fixer-upper. <laughs> Everything in the Bible, whenever God restores something, it is always in a much better condition than what it was ever before. Restore. Today we're going to look again at another. We spoke about Job last week, how Job was restored by God. How this thing that came along, how this thing that came his way was unexpected for Job because he was a God-fearing man. And the enemy tried to come to his stable and upset his whole life. And as Job set his mind on God, and as he set his heart on God, God restored him. He even reached a place, and I want to say this, you're going to find the same truths in this passage of Scripture again today. We learn from these uh, stories, we learn from these passages of Scripture that even Job's friends, the Bible says that when they heard what happened to him, the one thing that happened on the other thing, the one thing after the other, that at one, the, when they initially came to him, they came with good intent. They came to encourage him. They came to say to him, no, we're going to pray for you. But when the messages came in from him, losing one thing after the other, they, they became skeptical and became, the Bible says that one stage Job said, you are useless counselors and useless friends. Because when I needed you and you don't find answers, you start condemning me. His wife said, why don't you curse God? And that's uh, the reason why that is written into the whole thing, that we need to understand that at best, we cannot bring about restoration to our friends. Come on now. So, so, so Job had to pray for his friends. He got to a place where he said to his friends, you are not there. For, we'll find this again here. So let's read a little bit out of this amazing story of Jesus going with his disciples over the sea uh, to the other side and, uh, and meeting a man possessed by demons. So here's the story. Mark chapter 5. There's some stuff. Let's, let's ask God. Let's ask God to open our eyes this morning. Can we do that? Lord, I pray for a spirit of revelation, a spirit of insight. Pray that we will dis discern and see things that we don't normally see as we read your word and your spirit minister to us in Jesus' name. And then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. Can we start preaching right there? Say to the person next to you, there's always the other side. Doesn't matter what you're going through right now, there's always the other side. When they got to the other side of the sea of the country, the, the one translation says the region of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately they met with him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. A man with an unclean spirit. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains he had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped. Let's stop there for a while. Can we, just, can we just revisit some of these verses quickly? The Bible says that when Jesus and his disciples came to the other side, they were met by this man. I, I touched on it last week. I said, you know, God is bringing the church to a place where we go beyond information. It's important to read the word, reread the word, study the word. And as you read the word and study the word, we come to know the knowledge of God, how God sees things, how God understands things, how God feels about things. So the knowledge of God's Word is phenomenal. This knowledge that we gather should stir and stimulate to us, and, and by the way, to a place where we get inform the information becomes revelation. And that as we hear the Word and read the Word and see how God sees things, that Word, the knowledge, the accumulation of the information of God's Word should build in your and my heart what? Faith, the Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing the Word of God. You can't just study the Word of God for sheer accumulation of information and knowledge. If you read it and reread it and read it and reread it and you see how God looks at things and see things and perceive things, how God desires things to be, that very knowledge will stimulate and stir in you insight and, 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 and highlight things to you and, and revelation would come that will build faith in your heart concerning God. Come on now. And when you have the faith, you are, you'll find that you get to a place where you, you don't mind getting offshore and into the boat and get into a journey. 
There's too many people still on shore. They need to get offshore into a boat, the boat of life, the boat of the church, the boat of faith, and go somewhere. And the issue is not just to get the knowledge and the revelation, but get the faith. But for that, listen, it says, and when they got to the other side, out of the boat, the people need to get out of the boat. You can't just gather information, say to me that you have faith and never get out of the boat. Somebody talk to me, please. Help me a little bit this morning, just a little bit. You have to get out of the boat. The issue is that I want to tell you something about it this morning is that when you get out of the boat, demons meet you. Demons meet you. The Bible says when they got out of the boat, demons met them. There's a story here because I, I want to preach something this morning about restoration and God is going to touch someone's life here this morning and change it forever radically. There are some of you that are going to get commissioned by God this morning to get into the boat, out of the boat, and get met by a demon and not be moved at all. It's that season right now, commissioned by God to say, I'm ready to get into the boat, out of the boat, and face any demon coming my way in Jesus' name. So the Bible says that they came out of the boat, and there was a man that met them with an unclean spirit. And I want you to know the regulation concerning cleanness and uncleanness was going to separate Israel from all other nations. God set certain regulations in place to say that this is what you can and can't do. If you go and read it, you can go and find that in Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, I think somewhere in and around chapter 11, somewhere there, you read about what is clean and unclean. And it's got to do with three basic things. Number one, the ground, anything touching the ground, touching death, and some form of disorder. Okay? So here it is. If you would touch the ground areas where... Uh, causing things where you shouldn't go where uh, God said you can't go there and the physical dirt of the land that could make you dirty but specifically things that were there that were unclean things that were already dead or areas that was cursed in other words so if you touch uh, remember when Samson was not allowed to touch the dead lion otherwise you'd be cursed because there was a curse on that thing and it was unclean also any immorality or, or other thing wrong that you've done that God said you cannot or should not do that cause you to be unclean. The third thing that causes a thing to be unclean was anything that was out of order. In other words, it would be abnormal. Anything abnormal. So when God says that is the way it should be done and it's non, not done that way, it is out of order, abnormal and therefore unclean. It's also, that's why you also should uh, bring and offer a lamb that was perfect. If it had any defect or dysfunction or anything wrong with it, it would be out of order and therefore unclean. So in the Old Testament, God set His people aside by what would be clean and unclean, and they had to stay with that. Now, now I can't preach on that this morning, but I want to just say to you, you need to listen carefully now, because what affected Israel in the Old Testament, this way, in the New Testament, affected whatever was wrong that way. What do I mean by that? In the Old Testament, if you touch anything that was unclean, it would affect you. So that's why somebody that had leprosy had to live outside the city and shout, unclean, unclean. So that nobody would come within a certain distance of them or touch them, because if you would just touch a leper, you would then be unclean and couldn't come close to anybody or anything. You could, through certain rituals and certain behavior, get and certain steps taken by God, get that thing to be cleaned again. You had to offer certain things, stay outside the camp a certain amount of time, get uh, anointed with, 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 put blood on the tip of your ear, thumb, and your toe, and then put oil again. And in the process that they call a process of cleansing, you could be clean and bring back in again. So anything that was unclean, and not right, that touched anything that was clean and right, got unclean and not right. Good news is that in the New Testament, every time a leper touched Jesus, they got healed, and Jesus' life and healing went into the leper, and the unclean thing got affected by the clean thing. The good news, the life of Christ and grace is contagious. Did you get that? Okay, so, so listen, I want you just to read this a little bit with me. It's not just the story of a guy that was possessed with demons, that was unclean. So when the Bible speaks about unclean, 
There's a whole lot of reasons why he could have been unclean. Out of order, touched the dead thing, maybe because he's done something. But here's a man that lived in and amongst the tombs. Can we preach a little bit just and talk a little bit in and around us and just take it a little bit deeper because we're talking about restoration. He finds himself in a place of rejection as an outcast, as a man possessed by devils and demons. The Bible says later on when we read it, a whole legion of them. A legion in the Roman time was a, a group of soldiers, 6,000 of them. And this thing proclaims or declares that there's 6,000 of them in this man. This man is running around in and among the tombs. And the Bible says nobody could chain him down and hold him down. C can I say this to you? When, when you start dwelling amongst the tombs, if, if you start dwelling amongst dead things of the past, can I just preach a little bit here this morning? Please, somebody help me. Just let's read a little bit deeper here this morning, just as a story from a man that runs around in a, in a graveyard or in a cemetery. Listen, if you and I are walking around and we are all we can think about and talk about is some dead thing that has happened in the past. If you don't have vision, can we preach on Vision. Vision says in Proverbs, it says this, it says, without vision, people cast off restraint. If you have vision, it'll put a restraint on you. It'll put a discipline on you to look forward, and it's a different kind of a restraint. It's a discipline and a commitment and a loyalty and a faithfulness to what God has called you. And you will put your head down and your, and your heart into it, and you'll put your energy and your resources and your time into it because you've got vision. And that vision, that, that God-compelling thing, that passion in your heart is a thing that drives you forward. And it's a thing that puts a discipline and a commitment and a loyalty and a faithfulness to God and His course on your heart and it drives you forward. But if you haven't got a prophetic vision, if you haven't got insight as to what God wants to do with your life, and if your past is bigger than your future, you run around amongst tombs. And all you can think about is what was wrong and what went wrong and what you did wrong and what's smelling and what did smell in your life. And if you keep on dwelling there, you'll go crazy. Oh, come on now, church. Help me just a little bit this morning. I want to preach. I know God wants to do something here this morning. He said to me, preach. Just declare my word. Tell my people they can't run around amongst tombs. You can't run around, around the old thing, the dead thing, the smelly thing, and think of it and meditate on it day and night and think you will have a future. It's impossible. It's impo and that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to remind you of your past. He wants to talk to you about your past. He wants to talk to you about what you didn't do right, haven't done right, where you've missed it, why you should. And he keeps on. And here's the big deal. The Bible says none of the people that saw him could restrain him. It just simply means this. Whatever has happened to you, it doesn't matter how much counsel you get, how much encouragement you get, and how many people tell you what you should do and shouldn't do, and how you should approach the thing and shouldn't approach the thing, they cannot restrain you. Because before you can help yourself, you do it again, think it again, say it again, or behave like that again. Nobody could restrain him, couldn't bind him. Because when that thing harasses you, when that thing has conversations with you, when that thing speaks to you, it somehow has got the ability to break the restraint that people want to tell and put on you and say to you, you don't have to do that, don't worry about that. Whatever they say, you break that. And you rip yourself out of it because somehow we need to hear from something, someone, and yes, something more than just the feeling or the opinion of people. And the Bible says that this man, night and day, night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying, and it says, cutting himself. I thought I could put the word in there, condemning himself. with words, with rocks, cutting himself with rocks. And the Bible says, but when he saw Jesus. I remember when I started preaching this sermon for the first time in my life, and I got so excited because there's a truth in this that we need to see. And um, 
and that we need to carry in our heart with a clear-cut revelation and understanding. Uh, that I thought that every time people would see me, they would fall on their face. Because we called an anointed. How many of you know we are? It's just important that you know that people see the Jesus in you and not you. Because I've had some very exciting times and privileges of preaching in many places, not just in this country, but in other countries where there was such a manifestation of the glory of God and see devils and demons leave and fly. There are also times that I thought I should run. Because it's very important that we walk with a deep conviction of the Word of God in our hearts. Because here's the big deal, you see. Whatever we speak to people and whatever we counsel to people might put a restraint on their mind for a moment, might restrain them in their action or their attitude, might restrain them for a moment in how they see things or feel about things, but it'll never deliver them. Whatever we speak to people might put a restraint on their behavior, might comfort them a little bit, but it's, it's the blood of the Lamb. It's the mention of His name. It's the revelation of who Jesus is and the, and the working of the Holy Spirit that ultimately brings the deliverance. And the Bible says that it says that when he saw Jesus from afar. You know what's the most amazing thing you know about this thing? It, it says that when we begin to present to people Jesus, while we're still far from what we want to get to, but we start with Jesus. Just anything we start with Jesus by. When, when our intention is to direct them to Jesus, not to a program, not to a ministry, not, not, to, not to some thing, counseling session that we involve. And when, when our intention is to direct people to Jesus, when we're still far away, when they're still far away from fully understanding and knowing Him, they already bow their knee. Okay. They already bowed. The Bible says, when he was still afar away, he ran towards Jesus and worshipped him. And then he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. The, the original portion of the scripture just simply says this. He says to Jesus, what have you and I got in common? Just leave me alone. Don't. You know, we, we, we don't have to talk to one another because he was already, he already knew who Jesus was. He already had experienced the power of Jesus. And when he saw him afar off, he recognized him. And, and so he didn't want to deal with him, talk to him, and have anything to do with him. And he said to him, what a, we have got nothing in common except for one thing, that they had the man in common. Satan wanted to destroy the man. Jesus wanted to save the man. Uh, Satan's walking around, running around, wanting to harass you, wanting to resist you, wanting to get you to dwell in your past, in, in amongst all the things that are dead and smelly. I want you to know that there's a God after you. Oh, come on now. There's a God after you. And, and the Bible says that, that that's what Jesus had in common with him. Well, I'm telling you that's what he had in common. For he said to him, come out of him, you un." clean spirit. You that wants to disqualify this man, you that want to say to this man that he's out of order, that he hasn't got what it takes, that he's got a past, that he's done things, that when you look at the list of things in the old, old covenant and in the Old Testament, he needs to be stoned, he needs to be put to death, he needs to be put outside of the city, but I've come to bring him good news. It's time for you to leave now. It's time for you to, to, to get out of him. He said to him, get out of him, you unclean spirit. Today, God's going to deliver people from an unclean spirit. Amen. From a spirit that, is keep, that keeps on harassing you, speaking things into your heart, speaking things into your mind, polluting your thoughts as to who you are, what God wants to do in Jeffrey's Bay in the Koha area, what God wants to do with your life, with your family, with friends, what God can, because God is not a fixer-upper. God is a restorer. And this devil comes to him and says, don't torment me. And I want to say to you for a moment, listen, don't, don't settle for him just to stay quiet. Get him out. He's been tormenting you. It's time for us to torment him. When God puts fear on fear, 
because of His love and His power. And God wants you to know this morning, whatever it is that's harassing you, that's running around and messing you up, God says, today, if you would listen and again say to this thing, get out of me, you unclean spirit, in Jesus' name. Now, now people say, do you mean I'm possessed? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying all of us, as we sit here, have thoughts, have got voices, have got things that want to talk to us and keep us away from what God wants to do with, in, and through us. And you cannot afford, you cannot afford to dwell any longer in and amongst the tombs. Going for a little prayer here and a little bit of conversation there and a little bit of counseling there. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. Listen to me very clearly. Absolutely nothing wrong. But with an intention where, God, I want to hear what you say so that when you speak, whether it's through my prayer partner, whether it's through my counselor, whether it is through somebody that gives me guidance, I hear the voice of Jesus Christ that says to these things, be quiet, get out your unclean spirit, and that I've got a future. And I'm restrained by my future vision and purpose and not full, full of chains and shackles of my past and pain that keeps on pulling me back. But he said, come out of him, you unclean spirit. And then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered him, my name is Legion, for we are many. So there is a demon that speaks on behalf of other demons. And then he says, also he... So there's we and he. So there's a chief demon that is speaking on behalf of the others, saying, you know, we are, when he says legion, he means there's a whole lot of us. We're strong and we're working together in unity. Legion. There's a whole lot of us. We're strong and we're walking in, to, working together in unity to cause this man's pain, his destruction, his bad situation, his extreme conditions. We are working in unity with power together to get him in this state of mind. Jesus still just said to him, come out of him, your unclean spirit. Because when he dealt with him, you see, it's not about how loud we shout. It's not about how big a noise we make. Uh, sometimes we just do that to quiet the voices in our own heads. It's not, it's not how long we speak in tongues. It's not how many scriptures we quote. But it's really about the revelation that we carry in our heart about who this Jesus is and what he has really done when he died on the cross, shed his blood. And when he said it is finished, he really meant it was absolutely, totally and completely finished. That the devil has been sorted out, sin, sickness and disease, your past, the thing that arrests you, shame, guilt, whatever it is that he could throw on you to disqualify you. God says, I've dealt with that so that when you come to me, that devil, that demon will bow its knee. So the confession, the repentance that we do make is to say, Lord, whatever I got involved in that, that disqualify me, I thank you that you sent Jesus to qualify me. And I move away from trusting in that, relying on that, making my own way, trying to wangle a thing, but putting restraints on myself and let other people restrain. You, my deliverer, I'm trusting in you alone. And when I trust in him alone, the Bible says, well, one word. It says, come out, you unclean spirit. Then he begins to beg. And I, I haven't got too much time, but I want to say to you, don't let the devil negotiate with you. Don't, don't, don't sit. You know, one of the problems, one of the problems that we have, we, we don't want to lose our dignity and we don't want to lose our, uh, we, we want to be prim and proper. We don't want to be out of order and out of space and place. And uh, we want to be dignified. And, and sometimes what we want is we want to just feel better. There's a problem, you know. This thing has been tormenting this man for years. He's lost his family. He's lost where he stayed. He's been driven out of his town. He lives amongst the tombs, and he's in a place of discomfort, cutting himself, uh, running. I think it's Luke that explains it, and he says he runs around naked, out of his mind, cutting himself. Nobody could chain him, attacking people when they come past. To be honest, Matthew speaks about another man with him. In this, the other two uh, synoptic gospels, we don't read about the second man, but in Matthew there are two. We don't know what happened to the other one. I don't know whether he ran when he saw Jesus, but this one came closer to Jesus. But he's there. But, but one of the things that you shouldn't do is when a devil has harassed you for years and years and years and years in your life and keep on taking you back through the smelly areas and the dead areas and the things that are not working, and it doesn't matter how much, you can't counsel, you can't medicate, and you can't talk and pat a demon. You have to cast the thing out in Jesus' name. 
And so he's begging now. He says, please don't torment me. I know I've tormented the man, but don't torment me. And then he says, don't do this and this and that. Don't let the devil come and sit at the Lord's table with you and negotiate with you. The Bible says, I will set the table for you in the presence of your enemies. It doesn't mean that the enemy should sit at the table. And when you begin to listen to his conversation and his talks, and the talk is about your past and not about your future and where God can take you and where he wants to take you and what he can do with your life and what he can do through your life, if it's not about that, you're going to go into the tombs and dwell into the dark places and the high places of your past that are going to drive you crazy. But don't negotiate with the enemy. The Bible says a loud, large herd of swine was feeding there in the mountains, and he begged them, him to go there and they did you know the story and you know the preachers preached that not even pigs can live with demons uh, and so they w went over the edge and, 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 and then these people got such a fright that they they were unsafe people they got such a fright that they thought this man is messing up our business our farming he, he's, 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 a, he's, he's, he's a different kind of a man and it's better if he's not in our region because um, he might drive other stuff out of other people and we might lose the sheep and the cattle as well. I don't know what they thought, but they said, will you please leave? And Jesus left. And then they came to Jesus, it says, and when they went out to see what it was that happened, and they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed the one who had the legion within him sitting and clothed and in his right mind, that they were afraid. Did you see that? A man that was out of his mind, in his soul, mind, will, emotions. A man that was running around naked. And a man that had an unclean spirit. The Bible says when Jesus dealt severely, not negotiating, not talking, not trying to chain it in, in a in a carnal, natural way, when Jesus cast that unclean spirit out, the man was sitting, the spirit of unrest, this thing that chased him all over the show, that, that I just need to finish this, then I can do this, and I must quickly do this, then I can do this, and I must still sort this out, then I can, you know, that spirit of unrest, that thing that chases you around, negotiate with you, keep you busy all the time, that man was now sitting still. That man was now not just sitting still. The Bible says he was in his right mind. Say right mind. Fully clothed. Properly dressed. Th th that means when I read that portion of Scripture, it says that when God restores you, He restores your spirit, your soul, and your body. Michelle, thank you for your testimony. Praise Jesus. Can we just give Jesus one more cheer for what He's done? That simply means... That simply means that when we say, God, restore whatever has happened, and, and you can't restore it yourself. Job couldn't fix himself up. His friends couldn't fix him up. This man couldn't fix himself up. His friends couldn't put chains on him that would restrain him and bring him to his senses. He had to have an encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And when he did, he sits still. His mind is in a solid place. The Bible says God can give you the mind of Christ. He'll clothe you with a robe of righteousness, with a sense of purpose and destiny. And the Bible says that he was sitting in his right mind, fully clothed, spirit, soul, and body restored. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him. The one that, that how it possessed the swine and they ran away. I want to say three things to you today. I want to say to you that restoration is when God returns an object or a person to its original place, owner, and condition according to its divine intent and blueprint. That long before you knew it, before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you. And God had an intention and a purpose with your life. And Satan will do anything and everything to rob you from that thing and get you to a place where when you come through certain things, set you back, 
mess you up so that all you can think, maybe, maybe there was a time that God thought that. Maybe there was a time that God had a plan. Maybe God won it once, but I'm now a bit older and I'm a, I'm a bit further down the road and maybe I missed it. And, and all you can think of is may, he had once there was a great day and once there was a good time and once there was a dream, but now all you can think about is running around the tombs thinking of dead things and old things and it drives you crazy because there's a desire for you to go further and go forward and do something and go somewhere, but He will allow you. And, and even the best of prayers from friends, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but the best of prayers and counsel and encouragement ultimately doesn't do it because Jesus wants to do it. And when we bring people into the presence of God, into Jesus, and we speak in His name, he can cast that thing. So, so, so he, he wants to restore. I want you to know that when he restores, it's not a fixer-upper. He's not going to patch you up, give you a paint job, and send you up and say, just kind of hang in there. Don't worry. It's not that bad. No, no. He's gonna, he wants to restore your spirit, your soul, and your body. He wants to do something for you that no man can do for you because he's the God of the impossible. Bible says, and however Jesus did not, when he had got into the boat, the man that was demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home. Say, Go home. To your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy or compassion on you. To tell them what Jesus has done for you. To tell them what He has done for you and what compassion and mercy had on you. And the Bible says, verse 20, and He departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for Him and all marveled. Decapolis was a region. Deca means ten, polis means city. So Decapolis means ten cities. When we begin to believe that God can restore all things completely spirit, soul, and body, one man's restoration can bring revival in a region. When I call that girl out, and because it's real, and there's nobody that can take that away, whether it makes sense to you or me, whether we can imagine the horrific process and sp thing that she's gone through is actually irrelevant. The issue is that she could walk up here and with a beautiful smile say, I had a bad thing that happened, but God who wants to not patch it up and not just make me feel a bit better by saying to me, repeat the same thing over and over. The God of true restoration restored me spirit, soul, and body. And now I'm going to get out of the boat and tell Decapolis, I'm going to tell all the people in this Koha area that God can deliver, set free, and make whole and change people's lives. Now, let me say this to you. I felt God said to me a while ago, He said to me, you're going through a process of change, son, in this church. I'm mending the nets. I'm fixing the boats. I'm getting the systems and the structures in place. I'm adjusting and shifting leadership and everything else. He said, because I'm getting you ready for a revival. I'm getting you ready for something that you cannot do. Because you've gone out and throw the nets out on the left and came back and say, Lord, I sat for, for the past 34 years throwing out the nets. And you want to just tell me I just should throw it out on the other side? You see, because there's something that I want you to know that you cannot do. You can get ready. You can prepare. You could realign. You can repent and sort it out. And then you get to a place where you say, Lord, I can't deliver me. My friends and the people around me can't deliver me. The church, the koha, the nation and the area. But I thank you that I can come to Jesus. Come on now. I thank you, Lord, that I can't deliver people, but I can give them Jesus. 
not my opinion, not my feeling, not my emotions, not what I think they should do, because I can put as much restraint on what I think they should and shouldn't do. Uh, I can put as much fetters around their ankles so that they don't go and walk where they shouldn't walk. I can do it. They'll break it, because ultimately the force that causes them to do the right or the wrong thing is greater than my willpower, their willpower, and a little bit of counseling or a little bit of advice or a little silly prayer, unless they have an encounter with Jesus. And when they do, and the restoration takes place, people will look at it and say, supernatural. And a man, listen to what it says, just once and I'm finished. Then those who fed the swine fled and told it in the city. So there was a man amongst a few people, the, the owners or the farmland, the farmers that told it in the city, and the man that told it in the country or in the region. When one person's restoration takes place the way God intended it, it doesn't just save the man, it saves the city and it changes the region. It doesn't matter whether you got Michelle's testimony, just a drug testimony, a business testimony because you lost it all and God recovered you, because whatever it is, what it is that you go through, God can restore that and your part of your testimony will take people where they've never been before. Can we close our eyes? Can you stand with me this morning, please? Can you stand with me this morning? In Jesus' name.